introduce myself. My name is David Mulcahy. I'm, for my sins, technical director of Excel Events, uh, which kind of basically translates to I get to play with the toys um, while everybody else goes out and does the hard work. Here was a bit of a, a chat about Glastonbury and the Pyramid Stage last year, um, where we got to do something that hadn't been done before and probably won't be done again, which is really quite nice. So I launched uh, straight into it. The initial brief, um, which changed rather a lot over time, was could we do something on the front surface of the pyramid stage just above the, the front stage awning, which is quite a small triangular area? Yeah, that's not too much an issue. That kind of grew over a fairly short period of time to uh, could we do maybe three sides at that kind of height, so three small triangles at the top. Again, yeah, we need to think about it, but I'm sure we can. Um, pointing out that there is actually a light at the top of that, which is probably not the best thing to do with projection, but hey, we'll work around it. Um, when we got to, and you'll see some of the stuff we do later on with the visuals and bits and pieces, as soon as the members of the band saw some of the visuals, they kind of caught their imagination and suddenly it was went from can we do that to can we do both sides down as far as you can to where the truck bays are and the front and um, yeah of course we can at that point you kind of walk out of the meeting going well I think we can but yeah I'm sure we'll find a way of doing it <laughs> so having decided initially that it's going to be all three sides of the pyramid um, someone did talk about the back but it was like kind of no we'll just call it three sides uh, there was kind of discussion about who it was for. Initially, again, it was for, well, it's, it's for the audience. And if you think about, um, I guess some of you probably been to Glastonbury, think most of the audience don't see most of the pyramid from the, the outside surface um, until you're way up on the, the hills. Um, it then turned into, well, maybe and it's for TV as well. And I guess any of you who have done projection stuff, there is a, quite a big difference between what you can get away with for an audience and what you can get away for television, um, because it's got to go out through a camera. But having decided we were going to do it, the next thing was obviously, where are we going to put some projectors? Now, bearing in mind that it's, it's an empty site still, and all that sits down at Glastonbury is the frame of the pyramid stage, it's quite strange to stand down there on a sunny day and just look at this metal frame and go, okay, well, we need to put projectors kind of here-ish and there. So first thing we had to look at is working with the guys down there and Dick T was where we could actually put projector towers. Um, there were a number of options, as you can see. One of the, the key things that, and I know that Glastonbury have been working towards quite a lot, was to avoid large structures out in front of the stage. They were trying to work their way down from that, so they kind of chopped down a few towers. The things like the, some of the TV camera crew positions had gone. And we rolled up and said, OK, well, we want to put projection towers in there. There were a, a lot of discussions about that, about where they could go. Where we ended up was one, which is the lower purple dot, roughly, in the BBC compound. Um, Again, quite a few discussions about we want to put a projector tower in your compound. The other two could only be out in the public areas, which is, you can imagine from a health and safety point of view, they're kind of quite a long discussion about where they need to go. We ended up with one, which is kind of one of the higher purple dots, ideal position straight onto the, the side of the pyramid we were doing from that side, nothing in life's ideal, so we ended up with the one sort of up near the tree line, which meant we already had one side of the pyramid we were going to do at an angle, one side we were pretty much straight onto, and the front, we ended up behind front house control. Um, the logical place to put it, but obviously you've got to get over the stage. There were also lots of discussions about how much is anyone going to see given that you've got a stage, all the stage lighting running, and it has to be seen. There's no point in doing it if it just looks like a bit of a washed out thing draped over the side of the pyramid. 
So <coughs> we ended up with three towers, a stage left and a stage right one, six metre by six metre bases on them, and you can kind of get the idea now why there's long discussions about putting these out in the public area, because they're quite big structures. Two side ones, 12 metres high, and the front of house tower, 15 metres high. And believe me, when you've climbed up stairs to 15 metres high on an open projector platform on a windy day, you don't have to realise that you're 15 metres up. But it was a great place to watch the bands from. It was perfect. Um, about 1,100 kilos of projectors either side and about 500 kilos of projectors on the, the front. Again, there's a lot of weight going in, um, lots of health and safety discussions, and the guys were great about it. They helped us out as much as we could. Um, so the planning was all kind of sorted out. We know where the projectors are going to go. We were in the process of working out how many we needed, which we'll come to in a bit. Um, but we've got positions agreed. The next big question is kind of a bit of a, a strange one. It's okay, well, we now know we've got light, we've got towers, we've got positions. Does anyone have any idea of what the surface of the pyramid's like to project onto? And of course, everyone went, I haven't got a clue. We'll send you a bit. So we had a section of the material, and there were some very interesting discussions about what's it do when it's muddy? What happens when you get three weeks, four weeks worth of dirt over the surface? And the bottom line is you don't really know. So, but you have to factor that into the calculation somewhere. There was also, I'll just uh, skip back a couple, a couple of other interesting little things going on. Like if you look just to the, just above the pyramid stage, there's a white tent structure there. That's artist catering. So we know there's going to be artist catering. We know it's going about there. And then you say, well, how high is it? And that we don't know. You know you'll find that out when, when we've built it, really. So we're now projecting onto a material we don't know from off-axis projection with a structure that we don't know the height of or where its position is going to be on one side of it. And it's all starting to get a bit kind of, well, we'll, we'll work it out somehow. Um, there were long discussions about what do you think the weather's going to be like at Glastonbury this year? I mean, that's kind of a given, really. It's like, it's going to rain, it's going to be muddy. As he comes there. I'll skip through this fairly quickly. This is the, the techie bit. Um, and I guess if people have done projection, they've probably done this kind of thing in their head without even thinking about it. But environmental dynamic range, which sounds great. So you've got to take into account contrast. And again, when you're doing um, broadcast as well, it's quite an important thing that the blacks look black and colours look colourful. Um, quite boring. It's like, it's basically the difference between black and white is the simplest term. The amount of brightness you're getting out of the projector, but quite often you talk to people and they go, well, it's a X lumen projector. Surely that's bright enough. And that really doesn't matter. What actually matters is how much light you're getting back off whatever you're projecting onto. I mean, you could have the brightest projection in the world and a lousy surface, and you won't see anything. Or it'll look grey and washed out. Foot lamberts, I love these. That's the amount of light you're really interested in. That's, that's what's coming back off the screen. And that's what gives you a good picture or not a good picture. And then you've got this kind of wonderful stuff, ambient light. So now we've got a surface we don't know about, a building that might or might not be in the way, but we don't know where it's going to be. Um, projector positions we've got. And a big question about, can anyone tell me how bright it's going to be in June when Coldplay do their last number? I don't know. <laughs> it's like, will it even be dark? Well, we haven't sort of finalised the set list yet. It might be dark, it might not be fully dark, it might be about this time. So you can see there's even more kind of variables getting kicked up into this, which, um, as the person who kind of sat there when this is what we need in terms of kit, 
actually made me quite nervous at times. You wouldn't believe how many bits of paper I got through, sketching numbers out and, and then going, yeah, that'll do. I think it's enough. But ambient light is the one thing that really makes a huge difference. I'll skip through this. It's uh, basically to work it all out in an ideal world. You know what your target is. Um, and then it's a function of the square, foot, square footage of the screen times the gain of the screen, which is the amount of light you get back off it, basically. But then you add ambient light into that. So if you've got, I mean, 14 foot Lamberts, and sorry about the numbers, but it kind of illustrates the point. As a contrast ratio on a projector, have you got 1,000 to 1? Quite a standard high brightness projector is 1,000 to 1. And you get, obviously, black level, 14 foot Lamberts out, 0.14 is the black level. You've got a really good contrast ratio, 1,000 to 1. If you add in just half a foot Lambert of reflected ambient light off the screen, you add those two bottom figures together, and your contrast ratio suddenly drops from 1,000 to 1 to something around 21 to 1, which makes it a very grey, washed out, thing. So, I mean, the key point about this, I guess, is you've got, if you've got no ambient light at all, so if you're in a black room, then a very low-powered projector will give you a stunning picture. The minute you start introducing any light in there at all, then you've got to start playing with the numbers. So, the next interesting little task, because we know we, we need to know how much square footage we've got of screen. You look at that and you think, well, it's easy, you just do that. But it's a pyramid. And you actually need to know what the actual square footage of the screen is. So, since those surfaces lean away from you, they're bigger than that, it actually takes up that much, which is quite a big difference. So, I was sat there forever, working out, trying to remember maths from school, and say, okay, it's a triangle, and it's this, and it's leaning away at that angle, and, and we kind of got somewhere to this scary big number about how much screen surface we were actually projecting onto um, in an amount of ambient light that we don't know over a building that may or may not be there and all that kind of stuff. So we kind of worked out what our lumens need to be. That actually came out at we put, for each side, nine 20K projectors. So there was 20,000 lumens times nine for each side and four 22Ks for the very front, which I must admit, when we finally worked it out, the poor project manager nearly fell off his chair because it was a busy period. There was lots of stuff out and suddenly... I wanted them to find 20-odd plus projectors plus backups and all that kind of stuff. But we got there. So the next thing we've got to figure out after that is how to keep the whole thing working. Um, the way the servers work that uh, we use to drive this, they all have to, have, have to be networked. Now, bearing in mind that all our towers are a good 100 metres apart, we've got to run a network between them, the stage, control, which is further than you'd normally run a network. I think the poor guys that went down there ended up putting uh, stuff in traps and trunks and round trees and as well. So they were there for miles and miles of network cable that all went in. Um, we had a guy, we've got a guy with us that's very good on networks and he actually figured a way of keeping the network running over that kind of distance. We had to have a backup system. Um, it's kind of no use if you're going to do something that size and you've got no backup in place because I don't think I'd like to be there. Um, and it's, we discovered we're going to be driven off time code from the band's back line. So now we've got control coming from backstage to our control position, which was a porter cabin on one side of the stage, off to the side, and then networked out to all these towers that are spread around the place in unknown light and over buildings and all sorts of silly stuff. 
So that's what we had to put in. Obviously the network, since everything runs on the network, we've got to know what happens if it breaks and allow for that. Um, you've got to have enough speed because it's controlling the, the timing of all the pieces. And if one drifts out, then, and given that the whole thing was beat critical, if it drifted off, they weren't going to be very happy with us. And we had to build in all sorts of redundancies into it. So we had dual layers of networks in. We had dual time code links coming from the stage. Um, we sat for a long time testing bits and pieces and trying to figure out what happens if. So what we ended up with for control was a completely independent system. So on each tower, there were two media servers. There were two sets of control running, two sets of time code coming up. So you could afford to have one whole system fail and the other one would carry on going. Um, you had to have uh, separate networks running, which I've touched on. And everything was completely independent of each other. Again, I mentioned it, simply time code coming from the back line from Pro Tools. Um, there were a couple of interesting points because they couldn't tell us what the time code would be because apparently it changes every gig, you know, depending on what they're playing, where they're going from, and what you're sending you. Okay, so we've got uh, ambient light, a building may not be in the way, time code that we don't know quite what's going on, all this kind of stuff. So it was still, but we, we kind of got there. Um, one interesting thing we did notice when we got on site was that depending on what track they were playing, and bear in mind we were doing the last track of the, the whole set, the time code they were sending us was jumping from before it to after it to almost up to it to just after it. So it was jumping all over the place, which meant we had to have two people sat there keeping an eye on the system to make sure it didn't actually run into the time code that was going to trigger all this lot off because that could have been a bit embarrassing, really, if suddenly halfway through the wrong track, the pyramid lit up. It's like, uh, wouldn't have been great. So we've got all our systems sorted out. We know how we're going to do it. Roughly the next question is, OK, so how do you put content on a pyramid? I mean, it sounds very straightforward. It's just a pyramid. But it's not quite as straightforward as that. We had long discussions about, with the graphics guys, but what they actually wanted to do with this. And they range from, we're not sure, to, well, maybe we could do bits to go around the pyramid, maybe we'd have stuff coming out of it, right down to the fact we, we discussed at one point putting cameras inside the pyramid and then stripping away the outer covering so it would almost disappear. So you still have the framework there, but everything else would be projection, which would have been very cool, but didn't happen. So first point for wrapping it up, start with a CAD. It's a CAD of a pyramid. <laughs> it's like not terribly exciting. We then build a 3D model out of that in 3D Studio. So we can start putting textures on surfaces and things like that to add to it. And you start working out how the textures are going to sit together. Now, the first one, I mean, apologies for the, uh, the very blurry pictures, but they were just grabbed. Um, if you take the three, two sides, two large sides in the front and just lay them out, okay, that works okay. You've got three pieces and they'd sit together in a pyramid shape, which you can see on the right. And then you stick a texture on them. Again, three pieces, all very straightforward. The problem comes when you actually start trying to put them together. And a good kind of starting point, I guess, if you're ever looking at anything like this, is can I take a sheet of paper and can I fold it in such a way without cutting it or tearing it to cover what I want to cover? If you think about a, a cube, you can kind of, if you just miss out a corner, you can wrap around a cube quite easily. If you do something like a pyramid, there's no real way you can take one piece of paper and make it fit without putting a big fold in it or hiding something somewhere. So if you look at on the first side, where the blue circle sits, and then it would need to go onto the, the second one, and then onto the third one if you want to take content around it. 
there isn't a way with that kind of map that you could take an object, the first circle, and run it across and out the other side without it appearing in some very strange places first because the two bottom corners of the object need to be nearer each other and it comes in at a slant. So you end up looking at it for age and we tried various ways of doing this and when we got down to what the content was they wanted, we end up laying the surfaces out like that. Which may look a little strange but it does let you actually take content in a straight line around the pyramid stage or any other kind of structure. If you look at the circles now, you can sit them quite comfortably across each other. That was the kind of path we gave them for where the content could go. If you take a, a line, a box, whatever it is, bring it down, twist it, and then take it straight out the other side again, that, in terms of what it does on the pyramid, gives you a straight line all around the top. As it turned out, we ended up with triangles. And it was triangle was fireworks, bits and pieces. So that we didn't need to do a huge amount of this stuff. Um, bit of a relief, but there was, you know, the ability was there. We spent a lot of time discussing whether we'd want to, how we might want to do it. So now we've got some textures. We've got our infrastructure ready. Um, the next thing to do is start testing it. Now, I guess, being Plaza, that quite a few of you use WYSIWYG lighting design software. We use it a lot, particularly now that we can start taking live feeds into it, because we can start tying things together. And the other discussions we had to have were it will cast shadows, particularly the one that was out front of house doing one side of the pyramid. You've got the LED screens, which they couldn't quite tell us where they were going to go. Um, but we were getting used to that now. You've got all the structure for that. You've got PA towers. So we use this to actually partly, I suppose, cover our own backs in that we could explain to people that these are where the shadows will occur. Is that a problem? And there isn't any other way around it other than using an awful lot more projectors and from various different positions. Um, it was all agreed. That's fine. And on the final bits, there were actually some shadows that you could see, but it didn't really take away from the event. We built ourselves a, a 1 to 50 scale model of the pyramid stage. If anyone can find a use for that, it would be brilliant, because I don't know what to do with it. It's just, you know, it's a wooden pyramid. But we've got one. And we also started doing system tests for network failures and bits and pieces. So basically, we built the whole thing on a model so we could run it. You can probably tell that we were quite nervous of it's not working, um, particularly with it being the final track of their set. Um, everyone was getting a bit kind of, will it work, won't it work? Um, I had Des, who was around at the time, actually want to know whether, was I completely confident or should he have a car waiting at the back of the stage just in case, because there was no way he was going to go down to the dressing room if it didn't work and face the band. He was going to be off. So, uh, so we were pulling network cables out and cutting them and doing all sorts of bits. We had a system that if we lost the network connection completely, it would carry on going. It would just have lost its clock tick, so it would probably drift out slightly. Um, we worked out how long it was going to take to get it back, if we got a, re a new connection back in there, if we lost it for a while, um, how we could actually make sure it locked back into time. And what we, we had in the end was a system that would, if you lost the network connection, it would roll for a while. If it went out of sync, it would pick it up again as soon as the network connection was back. So we were fairly comfortable, again, going back to the, the dual methods, backups, full redundancies, and all sorts of bits and pieces that we, could, we were covered. So then we got to the on-site stuff, which was fun. I didn't get down there on the first day. We were there during the week prior, putting all these uh, network cables in. The guys loved me for that. It was like, yeah, there goes along that duct, along that riverbed, over that tree, around the back of there, and it, it took them a full week of climbing in and out of holes 
to put all the network cables in. So once we were on site on day one, we started building these beautiful looking projection towers. How could you not like the aesthetics of that? Um, initially, they're just open towers. Um, to put in the cladding on them, and I don't know if anyone remembers what the weather was like running into the beginning of Glastonbury. Getting them waterproof was an interesting task. Um, bearing in mind you've got on that one nine very, very, very expensive projectors all balanced up there and the wind howling through it and the rain lashing through the top of it. But we end up with them being waterproofed, which is why there's a little bit of a, a colour mismatch going on there because they weren't completely waterproof to start with. Um, but by the time we'd finished adding bits, they were. Interestingly enough, those, this is one of the side towers, and it looks very workmanlike with nine little holes for nine projector lenses. If you looked at the front of house tower, it started off like that. By the end of the week, it had lots of smiley faces, lots of holes in where people had cut little extra bits so they could watch the bands, it was looking really quite artistic by the time we had finished. So when we got the projectors in, we did an initial lineup using the warp cards and the barcodes. Because you've got nine projectors, we needed to get all nine of them kind of sat one on top of another so we could then warp the whole image. So the first job was to line the projectors up with each other on each side, and we used the warp cards and the barcodes for that. And then we started putting the, the maps on from the servers and content tests, and these kind of ran overnight. So we started these prior to the festival site opening, but obviously the other thing we haven't got a lot of time of that time of year is an awful lot of darkness. So there were some sort of late nights, but you get to bed early because it gets light about 5 o'clock in the morning. It's too light to see anything. And obviously we were on a... Yeah, it, it can't take any longer than it takes. We've only got that many days and it has to be ready. Um, we had a, a few lineup issues. We got those all sorted out. And it was quite nice to, to see it when it lit up for the first time. By the time we got to days four and five, and it doesn't really do it justice, but it did rather resemble the SOM out there. We were struggling to get ourselves just around the site. Um, obviously, we couldn't do any lineup tests, we couldn't do any production tests once the site was open. So, you've got a situation where you line it up one week, you've got that many projectors all lined up, the, uh, the track is the final track. Just to add a little bit of excitement to it, they didn't start the video until a minute into the track. So you've got a minute of black on the beginning of the video where you can see something's happening, but you don't know quite what's happening. Um, you can't run any tests, obviously, because you can't keep running the content out. There's bands on the stage up till late at night. So all we got was the night before was a very quick check to see that projectors were working, and we had little dots in the corners that were roughly lined up. Fine, we're kind of good to go, we think. And then it came to show night. Um, sadly, I never saw any of this because I was stuck in a porter cabin off to one side of the stage. So I never saw the actual live projection going out, apart from the bit I could see out the porter cabin window. We were asked at the last minute because the same thing occurred to um, the band's management that the band are not going to see it either. And kind of since they're paying for it, it might be nice if they saw something. So we took a part of the video and we flipped it and slowed it down so that there was something going to be on the the outside of the pyramid when they walked off stage. Um, there were a couple of things that we did in terms of lining up the content was just because some of it was straight lines. We flipped a couple of surfaces around to make lefts and rights match and bits and pieces. And the final result, which some of you may well have seen, was that was it from the front, from the front of House Tower. Um, I didn't see these two afterwards, but I was mightily relieved that actually even with that amount of stage light on it, it's there and it's pretty good. 
that's one of my favourite ones. That's from the BBC Compound Tower. And that's one of the, I've been accused so many times of you photoshopped that photograph. It's not, that's just a photograph. I mean, you can see what all the work that went to getting the right number of projectors in the right places gives you, even in that kind of environment where it's not fully dark, that level of black and that level of colour I was really pleased with. Um, and the final one I've got here, which may or may not work. from A to B um, in a very swift half an hour actually this time but anyone got any questions massive silence I'll stick my neck on the line because we were, we were told before we did this that it will never work. Right up to actually the point where we hit the button on Saturday night, we were told you'll never get that to work. I mean, that's, but in terms of shapes, given enough projectors and enough time to do it and the right kind of positions, as long as you can get light to it, then no, not really. He says, sticking his neck out. Anybody else? I'm getting off lightly here. <coughs> Is there anything, sort of general mapping stuff that anyone's got a question on? Or? Can you do 3D mapping on? We looked at 3D. I mean, yeah, we can do 3D projected, as in what people call 3D mapping in some respects. We have actually had discussions with various people about proper 3D glasses type 3D. And then, yes, you could if you could supply everyone with glasses and get them all in the right kind of position. With 3D stuff like that, there is a, a kind of finite position before it starts to look really odd if you go too far off axis, because that, that's the screen material. Um, it would have been intriguing. It would have been nice, but I think uh, if we had to go back to the band and say, Ow, and we want to clad the whole pyramid in 3D screen material, they might have said, enough's enough, <laughs> you can stop there. Um, do quite a lot of 3D mapping in terms of, see, it's odd, there's, there's two kind of strains to that. There's 3D as in 3D films, things floating in front of you, which we do quite a bit of. Um, and there's 3D mapping, which people kind of, I guess, refer to building mapping quite a lot as 3D mapping, because it sits on there and we do an equal amount of that. The trick with any of it, I guess, is making it exciting and interesting, trying to find up things that haven't been done. There's, uh, there's certainly a long way to go on it. Um, and like I said, it's, this probably won't get done again um, for a lot of reasons. One, it's been done, what are you going to do next? And everyone goes, well, that's the thing they did for Coldplay. And secondly, the um, Dust themselves don't particularly want the projector towers back, I don't think. Was, yeah, we, might, we might think they're things of beauty, but they're not really. They're quite ugly, big structures that have to go in the way. Anybody got anything else? Any over what the budget was? <laughs> um, it was quite expensive. Um, it, I can't really say, but if you imagine you've got all the content to reproduce, which we didn't do, um, a full crew on site for a week, plus all the pre-stuff, um, 24, 25 projectors and servers there for a week, accommodation, aka tour bus for most people. Um, 
it's an expensive thing. We part of this, it was kind of like we knew what we agreed a budget, but we wanted to do it anyway. So it's, you know, it's, you get offered a project like this, your kind of budget goes, yeah, as long as it covers its costs, we're happy because I just want to go and do it. But it was yeah, quite a lot. No more. All right, well, thank you very, very much. <laughs>